He is an internationally renowned thought leader in future proofing and cognitive bias risk management. He serves as CEO of the boutique future proofing consultancy disaster avoidance experts. Um, and he, they specialize in helping forward looking leaders avoid dangerous threats and missed opportunity. He's a best selling author, renowned practitioner, and academia. He's a good friend to ACP. He's been with us before, and we're absolutely thrilled to have him with us again today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gleb Sapersky. Good afternoon, Gleb. Thank you. Appreciate it, Ed. Appreciate that kind of introduction. And I, it's glad, I'm glad to be back. I think this is the third webinar I'm doing for ACP. So indeed, That's repeat cool. performance a number of times. Yeah, thank you. All right, everyone. So let's talk about how you as business continuity professionals can best address the risks, problems, and challenges of returning to the office. Business continuity, risk management, that's your expertise. And there are a number of risks in returning to the office and managing hybrid and remote teams that you want to be aware of. And these risks come from these dangerous judgment errors called cognitive biases that, as Ed mentioned, is a topic of my expertise. And these cognitive biases pose a serious threat to effective business continuity. So that's why you should know about them, address them, care about them. Let's talk about this topic. So, You've probably heard the phrase that people are our greatest resources. People are our greatest resources. It's something that leaders very often repeat. They say that people are our greatest resources. It's just very important. You know, they're our source, main source of competitive advantage. These sorts of topics, these sorts of phrases. Well, unfortunately, many leaders don't live by that principle. They fail to live by that principle. They really focus on what fits best their needs, their desires, what they're comfortable with. And they're overwhelmingly comfortable with in-office culture. Monday for Friday, nine to five, that's what leaders tend to be most comfortable with. So they feel very good about this Monday for Friday, nine to five culture, but this is not necessarily a good fit for their teams. And they want to turn back the clock. They want to turn back the clock to January, 2020, before the pandemic, because that's what they're familiar with. They've spent over 30 years, leaders at the top levels, becoming familiar with and succeeding in this in-office culture. They feel, they feel some fear, some discomfort, some worry about their ability to succeed in hybrid environments, in fully remote environments. And so they don't want that. They don't like that, even though a lot of their team members want that. And that may be the best thing for the bottom line of the company. So this is something that we really need to seriously be thinking about. What are leaders doing? What are they orienting toward? That is a serious issue because a lot of employees don't want to return back to the workplace Monday for Friday, nine to five. We'll talk about statistics later, but trust me that this is definitely a big issue. So returning to full-time office work this is a big problem that you're seeing a number of big companies, small companies, medium-sized companies falling into. It's really bad in a number of ways. For retention, we're seeing a number of people, you've probably heard about the term, the great resignation, where a lot of people are looking for new jobs, a lot, a lot of people, partially because they're being forced back to the office full-time significantly and so on. So this is a serious issue for retention and recruitment. Many companies are right now trying to recruit as they're getting out of the pandemic and they're finding it difficult to recruit if they're not offering substantial remote options. For morale, we're seeing that people's morale is seriously endangered by full-time office work. Their productivity, people are actually quite a bit more productive. You might be surprised. They're quite a bit more productive at home on their individual tasks. And so overall, their productivity is higher, about 10 to 14% higher at home, so working remotely, and especially on their individual tasks, a little bit less so on their collaborative tasks. We'll talk about that later. Work-life balance. People report much better work-life balance if they don't have full-time in-office work. Mental health and well-being. Again, much better mental health and well-being. And that all comes down to the bottom line of companies. Talking about business continuity, business continuity in the end needs to guarantee the bottom line of companies or whatever the organizations that you serve, your mission. And the mission, the bottom line of companies and organizations is really damaged by in full-time office work. And you've seen a number of companies really reverse 
their approach after they try to do full-time office work. Uber, just about a week ago, it tried to make all its employees, so Uber, major company, go back to the office and for full time. And it was finding that people were resigning. They were going to work elsewhere. The top talent was leaving them. And they were hurt on all of these areas that are dangerously bad for retention, recruitment, morale, productivity, work-life balance, mental health, well-being, bottom line. And they reversed their decision a week ago. And believe me, that was pretty expensive for them. That cost them millions of dollars in top talent leaving, in serious hits to morale, and of course, in changing their plans. Now, that happened in, with Uber about a week ago. On June 10th, so about just about a month ago, the same thing would happened with Amazon. Amazon was trying to make all its employees go back to the office, and there was, again, rebellion, people leaving. That was a problem. And that happened on May 5th with Google. Google was trying to make all its employees go back to the office and had to reverse its decision policy. And again, all of these companies cost them many, many millions of dollars to do so in lost talent, in changes of plans, and hurt productivity and morale. So this is not a situation where you want to be. And that's why when leaders say that employees are our greatest resource, but they still tell people to return to the full-time office work, that is a serious problem. So now I want to take a brief poll. You'll be able to see the poll in Zoom and you please answer the poll. Did you ever observe leaders failing to live by the principle of the people are our greatest resources during this pandemic? Please go ahead and vote. Is that something you've ever observed? See about half of you voted. Let's get a little bit more people voting. Give me five more seconds if you haven't voted yet. All right, so we see that just over a third of you saw that happening, that people, that leaders didn't live up to this idea that people are our greatest resource, and two, just under two thirds of you didn't. Great, so it's good to know what you've observed and what your perspective is. All right. Let's talk about what the research shows on getting back to the office and what people actually want. Now, there are eight major independent surveys that were run in spring 2021. And these are by independent organizations, organizations like, let's say, Harvard Business School. So you know, it doesn't have a stake in the which way people go. Or the Society for Human Resources, the Society for Human Resource Management. Again, doesn't really have a stake in which way people go, just wants to make sure that there is clear objective information. And what this information is showing is that over 85% of all workers, all workers who can work from home want substantial remote work. And 25%, over 25%, depending on the survey, from a quarter to a third, so 25 to 35%, want full-time remote work. Over 40%, depending on the survey, from 40 to 55% would leave their job if forced to come in full-time. And over 70%, 70 to 80%, would be less likely to leave if they're offered substantial remote work. So see that this is a really important issue. Working from home, we find, according to these surveys, improves people's well-being. And people would feel happier, very much happier, over a quarter or over three quarters would feel happier if given substantial remote work. Over 70% would feel less stressed. Over 75% would feel better able to manage work-life balance. So it's really important for people's well-being. Now, remote employees, I mentioned before, they are more productive overall. On average, they worked over 20 hours more per month when people switched from working in the office to working full-time remotely. And this makes sense. The biggest complaint of workers who don't want to go back to the office is the commute. And you're losing you know, something like an hour and a half a day if you're going 45 minutes there, 45 minutes back. That's a lot of time per day to lose. It's essentially unpaid work time you're devoting to work. If you're not having that commute time, you can work much more effectively and much more per month. So that's really important. Over 75% report higher or equal productivity when, so this is, again, depending on the survey, 75 to 85%.
And employees, importantly, would be a willing to take an 8% pay cut for substantial remote work. This is why you're seeing a number of people resigning, going to a different company, even for less pay, but where they're given more flexibility and more remote work time. Remote work challenges do exist. This is something important to address in going to more remote work, hybrid slash full-time remote work. Over 50% feel overworked because they feel that they are pressured to be on after work hours. So this is a, it's a plugged in into Microsoft Teams, Slack, whatever you're using. Over 55% experience burnout for the same reasons. Over 80% want less meetings. This is important to figure out and address. Definitely remote meetings are not fun. Oh, the biggest issues when people are asked to cite them is over 60% cite poor virtual communication skills, that there's challenges for their team members and themselves not having good virtual communication skills, and over 55% cite various forms of technology issues. So these are especially important issues to address. Now, that's the statistics. And I want to, before going on to some of the reasons behind this, ask you what your preference would be for working style after the pandemic has fully passed. So not right now, but after the pandemic has fully passed, what would you prefer to be your working style? So would you like to be fully remote one day a week, two days a week, three days a week, four days a week, or five days a week? Please go ahead. See, two thirds of you voted. Let's give you five more seconds. Make your voice heard. All right, so as you can see from the results, we have very few. So, you know, on average, obviously, this is a small sample size, but here, no one wants to do the equivalent of full time office work, which would be full time, five days a week. Even, no one even wants to do four days a week. Everyone wants to do either full time remote, so we have a fifth, or four fifths of you want some kind of hybrid schedule, mostly one to two days a week, a little bit, you know, small percentage of you, three days a week. So that's the desire for folks. And that's, we can clearly see that this correlates. This is pretty close to the results of the surveys, except that in the general surveys, a little bit more people want full-time office work. Why then do leaders at Uber, at Amazon, at Google, and at many other companies are pushing for people to come in five days or four days a week, but mostly five days a week, why is there such pressure from employers who want people to be full-time in the office? Well, this comes from these mental blind spots called cognitive biases. And as I mentioned, this is a major area of expertise for me for cognitive bias risk management. This is something that I do a lot. So we need to understand and identify these cognitive biases. A big, big, huge cognitive bias that causes leaders to do so is the status quo bias. We are comfortable with the status quo. This is a desire, this relates to our mental desire to maintain what we perceive as the status quo or get back to it if it's been shifted from. For example, this blindness to major disruptions from the pandemic where leaders are very much used, again, their 30 years career successful due to they perceive to being in the office, they feel they have, they have full oversight over their employees, they feel they can engage with them. Leaders tend to be gregarious and social. They want to talk to people. They want that sense of connection and they want that status quo and they're ignoring the major disruptions from the pandemic. I mean, no one here on this Zoom uh, webinar wants to go back to the office four or five days a week as the leaders at Uber and at Amazon and at many, many other companies are trying to get folks to do. And many of you want to only come back one to two days a week. Some you know, a fifth of you full-time remotely. But leaders are blind to this. They're blind to the disruptions from the pandemic and they perceive that they can turn back the clock to January, 2020. Another cognitive bias that's relevant here is called the anchoring bias. Leaders and everyone is anchored to our initial perception, our initial experiences and our initial information. 
So these leaders were successful before it became possible at all to do virtual technology. They tend to be older gentlemen and women, mostly gentlemen, who came to the workforce before it was really digitized. Their experience was in-person experience and they feel comfortable with that experience and they are anchored to that experience where that's where they're getting their information. They are perceiving this virtual, this digital technology through the lens of their initial experience. And they are saying, you know, this is not necessary. You can just do full-time in-office work. This is fine. And they are ignoring that work can be done differently if you de-anchor yourself from it and can be done just as even more effectively and definitely better for your morale, employee morale, retention, recruitment, well-being, and so on, if employees are allowed to work full-time remotely or at least part-time remotely, you know, spending only one to two days in the office. Now, a third set of mental blind spots, and a third mental blind spot on remote work has to do with how we get information. The way that leaders tend to look at information is that they think that, hey, this, I'm, all the people who I think are, are important, who are part of my tribe, who are part of the in-group, who work at my company, they, they should agree with what I'm saying. And so we believe that others who are part of our in-group, part of our tribe, share our preferences, that we sh they share our beliefs. And so we, we've seen this again at Uber, at Amazon, at Google, where the leaders at these companies believed that their subordinates shared their preferences. Obviously, they would, if they believed that their subordinates didn't share their preferences, they wouldn't have tried to make them go back to the office and then have to reverse their policies, costing them many, many millions of dollars. So this is a false belief, this false consensus effect and their beliefs that others share their preferences sufficiently and coming to the office, at least enough, or you know, they feel that they're you know, maybe saying that, that uh, they would prefer to stay full-time remote or just maybe come in once or twice a week, but they will you know, bow down and just do what the leaders say. Well, they clearly, that's a false consensus effect. There's, the strong, there's a strong desire on the part of employees to work substantially at least remotely and some full-time remotely. Another cognitive bias here is called the confirmation bias, this mental blind spot. You have might have heard of this one. This is the biggest and most prominent of all the cognitive biases that you tend to hear about. It has to do with how we figure out information. What I've seen is that leaders tend to freely ignore these major big broad surveys these eight surveys that I mentioned, which are very much in the news. There's a lot of information about them. And of course the Uber, you know, Amazon and Google HR staff, and they know about these surveys. They definitely told their leaders about these surveys, but the leaders went against what the surveys are saying. And the leaders have often not run internal surveys. This is kind of ridiculous, but I was giving a presentation to a group of middle market companies called Vistage and they, have CEOs from many, many thousands of middle market companies ranging from 50 people to 2000 people. That's kind of a middle market companies as members of their peer executive groups. And they did a survey and they found that less than half of all Vistage CEOs did surveys of their companies on their what their employees preferred in getting back to the office. So this is how confirmation bias happens when we look only for information that confirms our beliefs and ignore information that contradicts our beliefs. And so the way that leaders typically tend to approach getting back to the office and getting this information is talk to other leaders. So the CEO would talk to the C-suite, the C-suite would talk to the senior VPs and that's where it would stop. And these are all people who succeeded in their careers again, 30, 40 years through rising up through the ranks in, in office environments. And so they want to get back to the office and they're repeating the same information. And so they're ignoring this really clear hard data. They're not gathering internal data, they're ignoring external data on the major damage from forced in office work. And the final blind spot that I wanna share about is called functional fixedness. Functional fixedness, it's kind of a hammer tool syndrome, hammer nail syndrome. When we have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. We perceive that there's only one right way to function, only one right way to do things. So then when there was the series of lockdowns uh, in March, 2020, 
companies overwhelmingly all sorts of organizations not simply companies nonprofits government municipalities they imposed they transposed their office culture on remote work and they tried to do remote work full-time remote work using their in-office culture methods whether it's zoom happy hours other sorts of collaboration that does not work very well you need to adapt your culture your systems your processes thoroughly to make either full-time remote activities work as effectively as possible or hybrid work style work as effectively as possible. But companies overwhelmingly didn't do that. So they got that functional fixedness. They, they adapt, fail to adapt strategically to remote work, either part-time or full-time remote work. So these are the five cognitive devices, the five mental blind spots that I want to share with you about. And I wanted to ask you, which of these cognitive biases might be most problematic for your workplace in returning to the office. So please go ahead and vote. Which of these cognitive biases might be most problematic for the return to office in your workplace? See about two thirds of you voted. I'll give you five more seconds. Okay, we have a clear winner here, the status quo bias. So yes, I mentioned that as kind of the, the biggest one that I've seen. And I've helped 14 companies by now transition strategically back to the office. And this was the biggest problem that I've seen in these companies. And it sounds like that's the biggest problem you are seeing in your situations. Now, what would it mean to be competitive, to seize competitive advantage in this new normal? What would it mean to actually make remote, we're returning to the office work for the needs of employees as well as for the company? That would mean the team-led hybrid model with fully remote options. That's what I've overwhelmingly seen as the best practice from the companies that I've helped. So I helped 14 companies transition back to the office. 13 of them adopted this model. One of them adopted full-time remote work because it couldn't, it had various things that facilitated this sort of structure, but 13 out of 14 adopted this model. And this is a model where leaders give out broad guidelines for their, you know, for their employees. And the top leaderships, so the C-suite, so on, tells the local level team leaders, the supervisors of the rank and file employees, that gives them broad guidelines on what their employees should be doing. So majority of employees are going to go hybrid one to three days in the office. And that's exactly, we saw that 80% of you, that's what you want, one to three days in the office, mostly one to two days, you know, a few of you want three days in the office. And the minority fully remote, 10 to 30% would be fully remote, those who can be successful at do their work fully remotely. And we saw that about 20% of you want full-time remote work. So giving their team leaders, those local level team leaders, the decision-making authority to decide what their team does and while encouraging them to allow team members to, who really want full-time remote work, encouraging them to allow that if at all possible. And that will help companies. That's what really helps companies, all sorts of organizations gain that competitive advantage because now they're, li they're living by the principle that people are our greatest resource. And they gain that competitive advantage in retention, recruitment, morale, productivity, work-life balance, mental health and well-being, and therefore their bottom line. So this is what a competitive advantage in this new normal looks like. And the way that leaders are encouraged kind of as part of the broad guidelines to make the decisions is depending on the amount of collaborative work that their teams do. Individual work is overwhelmingly better done at home. There's extensive research showing that people are much more productive in their individual tasks at home on average. So on average, you, know, you have you know, rises, high rise in productivity, 20 to 30%. Collaborative work may be done better in the office depending on the kind of collaborative work and the kind of people who are doing it. You know, generally speaking, on average, you, you get more productivity from doing collaborative work in the office. So you wanna think about how much collaborative work you're doing and how much individual work you're doing for the team leaders and the teams in making those decisions. And again, if some people really want to do full-time remote work and they can be successful at it, encouraging team leads 
at the local level to allow them to do so. Now, full-time remote options. That's the, what I mentioned before for teams that decide to be fully remote. So there are some teams that might decide to be fully remote. So like we, we're doing mostly individual work and the kind of collaborative work we're doing, we can do fine remotely. And then individuals and hybrid teams. So those individuals who are working on hybrid teams. Again, those, so that's people who can be effective while working fully remotely. And another thing that I wanted to mention is potential career growth issues. Now there is research suggesting that if you're coming into the office in a hybrid schedule and you're seeing the other people in your office more, not simply your supervisor, but others in your company, in your organization, you are going to likely progress faster in your career. And that's something that has to be realized by those people who choose when they're in hybrid teams, we're not talking about fully remote teams, but for people who choose to be on hybrid teams, who choose to work full-time remotely, they may have slower career growth and they need to be okay with that. It's important, whatever you do, to do team building retreats for fully remote teams and also for individuals and hybrid teams for them to come in for team building retreats once a quarter. So that's something I strongly recommend. It improves social bonds and trust. That's a really best practice. And that's when you plan your team strategy for the next quarter going forward. As you're making these decisions and you're figuring out what to do, what you're going to work on, something you really want to do is you reshape your office space. This is kind of a pretty obvious once you start to think about it and once you figure out the strategy. So let's say your company goes through this process, you get information from team leaders on their plans for in-office work, and you're finding that you know, a small percentage of your team, of your employees are going to work full-time remotely, maybe something like, let's say 20%. And the rest of them are going to come in uh, ranging from one to two to three days a week. And then average, you average all of them out. You're seeing that you have, uh, you're going to have occupancy of, you know, 30% compared to your pre-pandemic time when you had, what's 100% occupancy, 100% at baseline, and then 30% in the future. So what you do is you look at your necessary obligatory office space, you know, for things like finances, things like you know, some conference rooms and so on, things like leadership offices, those sorts of things. So said, let's say that's 20%. And the rest depends on occupancy. So you can probably get rid of something like in this situation, 60%, 50 to 60% of your office space and save a lot of money as you're doing that. So that's going to be really valuable and important for you to get rid of most of your office space for your companies. And then for the rest of it, you want to address the office services. They want to make sure to say, so something like janitor, security, all that stuff, you don't need as much of that. For the rest of it, you want to change your office space to be more collaborative. That means that you know, you're not really gonna need your individual desks, your individual cubicles in the office because you'll be only doing or overwhelmingly doing only collaborative work. When you come into the office one day a week, what are you gonna be doing? You're gonna be doing collaborative work. That's why you're there. Why, are you, why else would you come to the office except if you're doing collaborative work overwhelmingly? So you know, you're gonna come in, you're gonna have you know, maybe a half day of meetings, maybe do a little bit of individual work in between. So that's gonna be your, you know, the, your, your one in office day or two in, in office days. That's the kind of things you'll be doing. So that's the kind of things that you'll be working on. And that means that right, the general baseline default of office space is something like 20% collaborative and 80% individual. This needs to be switched to something like maybe two thirds collaborative and one third individual. So you want to retain some individual office spaces for leaders who need to have closed door conversations and that's fine. For the rest of the team, you know, maybe it's something like oh, some percentage of your office space, maybe 15% of it to be floating desks to be you know, assigning a certain couple of desks to each team or something like that, or making it any desk available for anyone who comes in. And then the rest of it should be conference rooms and collaborative spaces like conference rooms with good video conferencing technology for those people who are coming in for hybrid style meetings. And you want informal collaborative spaces such as lounges for those informal collaborations, which are really helpful as well. So that's reshaping your office space. Next. You want to do funding for home offices, something that's not really thought about. Only 25% of companies funded their 
employees' home office spaces. But this is a mistake. This is a serious mistake because if you want to make sure that your people are productive, you really want to make sure to fund their office space effectively. And you can use the savings from real estate cuts to fund your home office spaces. This is going to be things like internet connection. I'm, su increasing, I'm surprised, very surprised by how many people have not upgraded their internet connection to be above that kind of whatever lowest baseline that their internet service provider offers. Their equipment, you need to not only have good laptops, you need to have good microphones, good cameras, good lighting so people can see you, see your facial expressions when you're having meetings so that make, they make sure to communicate effectively. Ergonomic furniture so that you're comfortable in your office space. Soundproofing so that in case your space is loud, you are going to not be distracted. Room separators. If you don't have a separate dedicated office, you can get a room separator and that's going to be really helpful and so on. This is stuff that really increases people's productivity. It's very much worth it. And remember, if you're coming in one day a week into the office, that means that if your team members are coming in one day into the office, that means that the four days into the office, their office space is your office space, your company's office space is in their offices. So you want to make sure to make it as suitable for productivity as possible. And that will improve their productivity. It's so worth it. We can talk in the Q&A if you want about the kind of sums we're talking about, but this is a really important dynamic for funding for home offices. Next, you will really want to revise performance evaluation. The old style performance evaluation is that once a year or once a quarter an evaluation is mainly based on people's presence, where people spend time working. How much did you spend time working? That's not going to work and that's not going to cut it in a mostly hybrid for hybrid first model with some remote options. You want to focus on your productivity, how productive you are, what are your accomplishments, what are your deliverables. And instead that, in, that involves instead of changing, instead of having your employee productivity be something that's you know, once a quarter large meeting, you want to focus on your individual tasks and collaborative task productivity in regular small meetings once a week. So switching from those annual performance evaluations to weekly report evaluations and check-ins. That means that each, each week, a team member would send to their team lead a report on their top three to five accomplishments for the week on challenges that they faced with these accomplishments and how they fit, address these challenges, solve these problems, on their plans for their top three to five accomplishments next week, and then on self-evaluation for the score that they would give themselves. And then they schedule a 15 to 45 minute meeting with the team lead. And usually it's gonna be closer to 15, you know, longer. It's gonna be longer if you need to discuss some things where you address the accomplishments, talk about them, then the team lead might coach the team member on ways of better solving problems that they run into. You're gonna agree or revise your accomplishments for next week and you're going to agree or revise your self-evaluation for, and that all feeds into the promotion process, into the evaluation and promotion process. So you have a continuous evaluation and continuous improvement in small regular increments. That's going to be a much better performance evaluation that's fit for the future of work in the mostly hybrid offices that we will have going forward. I'm gonna do a poll right now on that question. Do you think revising performance evaluation to align this with this more hybrid slash remote work style, would that be valuable for your workplace? Please go ahead. Let's see, we have just under two thirds voting. Let's give you five more seconds. Make sure to make your voice heard. Okay, so we see that this is overwhelmingly would be valuable. Everyone believes that this would be valuable. So I'm glad to hear that. So this is something to really be thinking about bringing to your, to your HR, to your leadership, to your CEOs, C-suite and talk about revising performance evaluation for this new hybrid model. This is something that is not really being focused on and discussed nearly enough, as well as home offices. I was <laughs> funding for home offices, it's a big issue. Two other issues that you want to be thinking about. 
One is adapting your culture. Adapting your culture, you, again, you simply would, as you saw from funding from home offices, revising your office space, revising your performance evaluation, you can't just snap your fingers and say, now we're going hybrid, everything is fine. You do not want to trans make the mistake of that functional fixedness on transposing your in-office culture from pre-pandemic onto the hybrid environment that will be mostly the environment for the future of work with some full-time remote work. So you want to adapt your culture. You want to replace office culture style bonding with native virtual formats. Again, Zoom happy hours, Zoom meetings are not very good for actually having effective bonding. So with hybrid, you'll have team meetings maybe once a week on the day that you're coming in and the rest you want to do each day at something like a text-based morning update where whatever you have, you have Slack, you have Microsoft Teams, for each team, six to eight people team, you want a separate small channel within the Slack channel, Microsoft Teams channel, where you have an opportunity to discuss to each morning, have a personal conversations where you just share, you just send a message on what, to, how you're feeling, how your mood is, what, you're, what you've been up to at home recently, what's been going on in your private life, of something about you that most team members may not know, and then something fun that you want to share, and then something that you're going to be focusing on, what you, what's your main top accomplishment that you're going to be focusing on this day, and then respond to three other team members. That's kind of an equivalent of a water cooler conversation in a virtual format, and that's been shown to really help people humanize and cue each other to each other and keep that team building on cohesion and trust. And then that same channel can be used for personal chats throughout the day. So you can personally chat on whatever topics you want. And that's going to be really helpful. And then digital co-working is something else that has been found to be really helpful. So what that means is on the days that you are not meeting in the office, you will for maybe an hour, a day or so, depending on you know, maybe two hours, depending on what works for your team, you're going to all dial into a video conference call where you turn your microphone where you start by sharing what you plan to focus on for that hour in your work tasks. And then you turn, turn your microphones off, you leave your speakers on, and then you either choose to leave your video on or turn it off, whatever you prefer. And so what you'll then be doing is just working during that time. As you have questions, you can turn your microphone on and ask the question to your, the rest of your team members. And that's going to be really helpful. So you can focus a task, you can leave a task to focus on in that digital co-working time for a task that you anticipate having questions for your team members. Or if you came across some other, some questions during the time that you weren't doing digital co-working, you can save up the questions for that time. Another thing that's been really helpful is virtual mentorship. That means two people, so two people as virtual mentors, someone from the team for, and this is, of course, mentoring for people who are more junior. Someone from the team, so a senior team member from their team of six to eight people as a mentor for a junior team member. And then also someone from outside the team. One of the problems with hybrid schedules, full-time remote work schedules, is that you don't get to, compared to in-office, nine to five in-office, is that you don't get to know as much people from outside of your team. So you want a virtual mentor from outside of your team. And because you have a number of mentors, at least two men mentors, you can get more, but at least two, the, you, each individual mentor can have more than one mentee. And that's because they know that they're not the, all, the only mentor for that person that really helps the dynamics of mentoring. Another thing that you want to think about in adapting your culture is addressing diversity, equity, inclusion concerns. We know that overall, there is some digital discrimination and there are some interruptions in privilege where people who have privilege, white males, and interrupt others who are in minority positions, especially women, much more often than they're interrupted. So that's a problem that needs to be addressed. Now, interestingly, when you look at who, when you look at people who are in minority positions coming to the office, so for example, there was a study comparing black knowledge workers with white knowledge workers. White knowledge workers when you look at them coming into the office, maybe something like 20% want to come to the office full time. Black knowledge workers, only 3% of them want to come into the office full time because of this, the reality of discrimination. So they're still facing discrimination, microaggressions when they come into the office. 
and they don't like that. So they definitely, it, it's definitely an important aspect of diversity, equity, inclusion to have hybrid schedules or potentially full-time remote work schedules for people who are in minority positions who are facing discrimination. So that's culture. The next thing I want to highlight is upskilling. So you want to provide training, provide training for your team members on how to do hybrid effectively. Effective hybrid work isn't easy. We have not done that in the past. We've done full-time remote work. We've done full-time in office work. Hybrid work is different where you're only coming in for, you know, let's say one day a week. That means that you really need to prepare for that day. You need to be fully prepared and you need to know what to do at home and what to focus on in the office. So the, what in the office will be collaborative work that you prepared for at home fully thoroughly. Whereas at home, you'll be doing your individual work and preparing for in-office collaborative work. Then you want to for focus on providing people with effective virtual communication. That's two types of virtual communication. Virtual communication when we are both doing virtual communication. So you are dialing into a webinar or a full time. Everyone is virtually communicating or when you are when you are either, when somebody's, let's say you're in a hybrid meeting and you can be either the person dialing into a hybrid meeting or you can be in the hybrid meeting and you can have other people dialing in. You need to learn how to communicate most effectively in all of those situations. You know, companies have been, before the pandemic, have invested a lot of money into training people on communications, but they have not invested almost any money in training people how to do effective virtual communication, effective hybrid communication. It's kind of ridiculous. The same thing applies to collaboration. Companies have invested so much money into teamwork before the pandemic, but they've invested very little money into effective virtual collaboration, whether it's all virtual or some virtual, some hybrid, some in the office. That is, again, kind of ridiculous. These are very important skills. These are skills we don't have. And these are skills that are very important for communication, collaboration, productivity, retention, recruitment, morale, and engagement. And this is something that's not being done. All right, so now I'll do another poll. And I'll want to see whether you think it would be helpful to adapt your organization's culture to align with a more hybrid remote work style. And as part of that, upskilling your employees via training for this work style. So would that be helpful for you? Please go ahead and vote. So two thirds of you vote, almost, yeah, two thirds of you voted. So I'll give you five more seconds. Great, so all of you feel that this would be helpful. I'm glad to hear it, excellent. So I will send out some free resources based on this presentation. I'll let you know what they are so that you know. There's gonna be a white paper on returning to the office, benchmarking to best practices for competitive advantage. My best-selling book, a copy of my best-selling book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. And finally, free coaching sessions. There's gonna be free available for the first three claimants. You'll see a link, I'll send you a link. And in that link, if you can click it, if it's clickable for you, and if you can schedule something, that means that you are one of the first three claimants and you can schedule that session. All right, so that's all I want to share. And at this point, I'll be happy to take any questions that you might have. Please go ahead. So <laughs> drinking from the fire hose, I don't, I don't see any questions actually. Um, but, but I guess uh, may, maybe you could expound a little bit on, on some things that organizations might be doing that aren't working. Sure. So I mentioned already, of course, full-time remote work is full-time in-office work is something that's definitely not working. Uh, something else that's not working is transposing in-office culture on hybrid work. I've, I've, seen, I've seen some real problems as a result of that, where people are not adapting their, their performance evaluations, where they're not training people on how to do this, and people are confused, and they're making mistakes on how to do hybrid effectively. So again, not upskilling them, where they're not doing things like addressing digital discrimination, so diversity, equity, inclusion. All of these are serious mistakes that I'm seeing, and that will be haunting companies going forward in this wave of great resignations. We're seeing a lot of people resigning, and that's a big problem. And the big reason why they're resigning, and they're saying that this is the reason why they're resigning, is because of their bad company policies on returning to office. 
um, question came in just now, and, and I, I agree with you completely. You know, the the, the whole culture issue is, um, generally speaking, um, a lot of places that I've worked, it's mm -hmm. it's not even considered. It's not something they discuss. There are some companies that are forward thinking, some somewhat progressive, and they'll they'll talk culture, but most of them, culture is something that just happens and they deal with it. And I think yeah. you've probably seen that. Yep. And, um, that, and that and that kind of it's that's not as bad when you're doing in office culture and everyone has a similar understanding of you know okay this is what in office work is about but when you're transitioning fundamentally to hybrid to hybrid work that's a very bad idea your culture needs to be a fundamentally important question that you address and if you don't address it you're going to be in a lot of trouble yeah you you can use um the the the, the distance the you know virtual meetings and so forth almost as a facade. Mm -hmm. And for somebody who was just hired, they're trying to learn the culture through basically only through virtual contact. It's it's very, very difficult to do it at, at all. And, and if they're trying to fake you out, <laughs> somebody wants it to look like something that it isn't, it's not that hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, from a BC, a business continuity professional standpoint, do you have any thoughts or strategies on how to work effectively on working with stakeholders in hybrid or remote environment. So what you want to do from business continuity perspective is identify the risks that are coming up. And one of the biggest risks that BC folks are not thinking about is that individuals offices, their home offices are now part of the company office. So what's happening is sort of a diffusion of risk. Let's say that your company, you know, is headquartered in you know, Miami, right? And then you have Hurricane Elsa coming at you. <laughs> that means that you, all of your risk is concentrated, but that means that you can strengthen, you can harden your company office accordingly, protected from hurricanes. Now, what happens if you have some people who live in Miami and who do their in-office work? What happens if you have some people living in California and there's wildfires? What happens if you have some people living in Portland and there's the you know, weather events? And they are all now working remotely. Let's full-time remotely. You have some people who are working on that. What do you do in that situation? Well, you need to make sure that you protect the, you harden their home offices, that they know how to harden their home offices, and you provide them with guidance and fighting, funding on hardening their home offices. That's kind of one aspect is hardening their home offices. And the second one is providing cross training and backup from business continuity perspective. So if you know you have some people who are working full-time remotely in Miami, right? Or if they're working hybrid and you know your headquarters in Miami is hardened, but their home office is not hardened. How do you make sure to provide cross training for these specific people who might be at more risk when they're not coming into the office. So that's something that you really want to be thinking about from a business continuity perspective. So addressing those, that diffusion of risks and making sure that people's home offices are hardened and making sure that you are addressing geographic risk by making sure that there's cross training, whether there's cross training for those people who are in locations that tend to be hit together. That's kind of one dynamic that you want to be thinking about. Another dynamic for working effectively as a business continuity professional is making sure that you get yourself some good training on virtual communication. Because you are, as a business continuity professional, you need to be making a very good impact on other people when you're working virtually and when you're working in a hybrid environment. And that's harder when you're not face to face with people, right? When you're doing virtual. You need to learn how to communicate most effectively in a virtual manner. So that's something important. And you need to get yourself really good virtual technology. It means microphones, it means cameras, that means things, that means lighting, so that you convey the best impression and can convince stakeholders to take business continuity as seriously as possible. That's kind of another dynamic. A third dynamic is thinking from a long-term perspective. You know, this Delta variant is coming and I've been seeing something about a Lambda variant that's coming. There might be more variants and we've seen that the Delta variant is definitely more uh, able to have breakthrough infections against the vaccination. You know, we've seen that, in, for example, Israel is very strongly vaccinated using Pfizer. And a recent study about, I think I wanna say something like five days ago, it came out that originally the original variant of COVID, Pfizer was something like 95% effective in Israel. Now the effectiveness is down to 64%. 
So we see that you know, there might be other variants of COVID. This is definitely a serious issue. You want to be able to shift from business continuity perspective from let's say your office is working hybrid. You want to be able to shift to full-time remote work if you have an outbreak in the area. And having a hybrid schedule facilitates that very much because people are already able to work remotely. So you want to practice and be able to shift into full-time remote work at a moment's notice, whether it's you know, due to a hurricane, whether it's due to COVID or any other sort of disruption. Well, a lot of food for thought there. Um, and and it's, it's certainly related, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting question, I think. What would, what would a stipend value be for a home office, not including your computer? So what the companies that I've worked with have done is anywhere from two to 3,000 per year, and that included the computer. So I presume, you know, minus $500 or whatever with that for the computer. So the, uh, that's kind of the average size of the stipend, and that depends on whether it's a for-profit, non-profit size of company, startup, and so on. $2,000 with uh, generally an additional $500 for working mothers, because it's been shown by research that they have more disruptions with their children, and that $500 helps alleviate that. So that $500 is for everything, including you know, computer, microphone, technology, all that sort of stuff, good internet connection, good ergonomic furniture, and all of these sorts of things, room separators. That's the kind of amount of money that generally offices that companies are already spending per employee on in-office activities. So you just want to transfer that money and spend that on their home offices because that's essentially going to be part of your company office. Um, are, are you seeing that like, like in, in a small percentage of companies, a large percentage? Uh, I mean, how many are we seeing that are doing it versus not doing it? We've seen that 25% are doing it and more are increasingly doing it as the transition comes from home to the office. I was just talking to Northrop Grumman and they, were, you know, I, they were realizing that, okay, we're doing some things, but this is a, definitely a serious issue that we are overlooking for our employees. And yeah. so now Northrop Grumman is going to seriously be looking at changing this and funding their home offices. And this is an example of a huge major company that is exactly realizing that this is an oversight and a mistake, and this is something that they really need to address. Okay, very good. So we're running up, uh, it's a five of uh, the end of the hour, and we, we, I don't see any more questions. So I'm gonna, I think we'll do a wrap. My, um, Excellent. Gives everybody back three or four minutes of their day. What a great uh, presentation, really um, a, a lot of rich information. And I, I know everybody appreciates it as much as I do. So thank you very much, Gleb. You're welcome, um, Ed. Well, we also wanna thank uh, everyone who attended the program today. Um, check the website, acp-international.com for upcoming programs. Um, all of our webinars and presenter slides are generally available for ACP members on the website. Um, you know, the recordings are there. This is only a small amount of what you're missing if you're not an ACP member. And if that's the case, visit the website um, and get some more information. Again, acp-international.com. Thank you all again. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy. Have a great day. Gleb, thank you again. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.